Thank you. Ooh, props. Um, I, I, got, I always got props with me all the time. Uh, so, yes. Um, basically, I'm just going to go super quickly through the stuff um, and uh, to explain where I'm coming from and, and so forth. So, um, I have been in fashion tech 20 year, for 20 years. I'm very interested and always have been interested in how we actually sense um, the body. Um, I also built my first helmet as a game controller in 96. Um, and I programmed Java for a Swiss securities company. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so fun stuff too. Um, but the thing what I'm really interested in is tokenizing the body. So basically um, using, and I actually, I love data and I think it's cool and I don't see anything black. I mean, yes, you know, there's a lot of negative around it, but I'm the positive person it seems. So I think data is awesome um, and we need to embrace it more. Uh, so basically we're tokenizing the body. What that basically means is we are taking sensors, uh, biometric, genetic and also environmental data from the body and then we contextualize that data and we want to democratize healthcare. So basically um, that's me, superwoman, of course. Um, and I love the way that we actually call this data, data. And I said, oh no, we have super data, data. And the way, um, the reason why I'm calling this super is I'm a snowboarder and when you come down the slopes in Austria, and I'm Austrian, we speak German, but when I come down the slope, I say, I come down and I'm going, oh my God, that was super. So basically that was the name, <laughs> right? That's where it comes from. It's trademark too, so every Austrian who is ever using it in their lifetime, I'll make a buck of it. Um, <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Um, but what is very important for me is using data for good. So literally taking this whole uh, notion about data and really creating something of substance. So we want to democratize healthcare. Uh, and the way we want to use it and the way we want to do this is very simple. We are looking into lifestyle data from Gen Z, the 16 to 22 year olds, and even younger, that would be great. And the reason why is um, I've been an active athlete um, border crossed, um, and now a bunch of my friends actually develop chronic conditions, breast cancer, and you name it. And the doctors go like, oh, we don't have enough data, we don't know where it came from. What did you eat 20 years ago, right? So that's basically one of the reasons why we want to capture the data. So the data that we are capturing is from all different types of wearables, phones, and so forth, but also we can actually use IoT devices to gather that type of information. And that is biometric, so anything vital signs and so forth, and I, and I completely agree with you about your motion, so that's bullshit. Um, my students have been trying to do this for 20 years, it's always the same shit, never really works. Um, but what is really important is we can do get data sets. Uh, so that is your temperature, that is something as benign as your heart rate and then correlate that out. That is what your motion, your movement and all of these good things. It's also your genetic disposition. So if you have Ancestry, 23andMe, all these uh, companies now enable us to do um, a genetic disposition as well to see though uh, what you're predisposed to um, or what your disposition could be. The other is um, environmental data, and that is very, very dear to my heart. So um, as a surfer, what is very um, interesting is you surf, you surf in Malibu, uh, they dump the trash into the ocean, and you actually get ear, uh, ear, um, eye re irritations, in particular if you wear contact lenses like me. So that is very important. The, the environmental data, what you're exposed to at all times, is very important for your health. Um, so. Just a few numbers, because I'm also an economist, so I'm, I'm basically really interested in macroeconomics and social impacts. Biometric data used for healthcare and for uh, crypto uh, uh, currency right now, cryptography right now, 32 billion worldwide, that's global. Um, we got 2.8% using diabetes apps of those of the 383 million patients we have worldwide. And that, of course, now looking into 16 to 22 year olds, of course, the correlation is much higher. Uh, we have $6.2 billion cost patient acquisition for clinical trials. In order to do that, uh, actually only 4 million of, sorry, 4 billion are really worthwhile. 2 billion are already like lost because they fade out or they're not even uh, patients that we would actually need for the, the clinical trials. Um, so who is Gen Z? Well, Gen Z, um, first of all, they look really cool. Uh, they're also born after 1986 
or after 19, yeah, sorry, yeah. 96, duh. Um, that's basically meaning uh, they have never, even in the mom's warm, been without the internet. Nobody else thinks that's cool, all right. Uh, there are about 40% of the population, that's 2 billion people by 2020. That's a shitload of people, okay? It's awesome. They're super actionable, socially and environmentally. Yes, of course, generalization, yada, yada, yada. But at the same time, they're really um, people that, oh, a group of, 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 well, maybe that's why I'm so positive, because I think they have a fantastic way to think about the world. They are also the patients of the future. 31% actually use wearable devices or tend to say, well, wearable devices probably gonna um, you know, um, exchange, um, tell us what we're predisposed to, et cetera, et cetera. So they really believe that technology will improve their healthcare. Let's see whether that's actually happening. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is basically the, I'm wearing this, I'm actually not wearing it, but. Um, this is what the bra is looking like. So we actually started with this, and then now we actually are using any type of device there is. This is actually, this, yeah, this can measure heart rate, motion, and temperature. So he have heart rate right here. Uh, Mercedes came by and shot it and did a video on it. What is really important also is they're fiscally conservative. So those teenagers are fiscally conservative. Who knows why? 2008. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's it. 2008, in every household, whether it was rich or poor, everybody was like, oh my God. And the kids were super, super tiny at that time and the emotional aspect, um, what they actually gathered, it's extremely important now for us. Uh, they do still have, a, it's huge, 143 billion globally though, direct spending power. Of course, most of that in the US and in Europe, but they're also influencing their parents. Mom, I want that. So very, very important. And also what is very interesting in the US particularly is who knows what a helicopter parent is? All right, who, what's a helicopter parent? <laughs> it is, pretty much. Exactly, so it's basically parents that are sort of hovering over their kids, right, like this. Uh, that's why digital wallet is super interesting. So it's not only interesting because we are actually also going to um, be developing in South Africa and in some other uh, countries in, on the continent, but it's really, really thinking about what is a digital wallet. And 10 years ago, I had a student actually in Austria developing a digital wallet. And it was like, what is it, right? And now it's like, okay, it's obvious because you know, we got Bitcoin, everybody understands what is currency, what is a cryptocurrency right now. So a digital wallet is nothing new to that generation either. We need to be very, very aware of that. So that's why if somebody is asking me right now, why am I not developing this for a 60 year old? I'm like, dude, it's too much marketing cost. I have to explain to you why cryptocurrency is somewhat good. I mean, not all the aspects, of course, not the thing that happened over the last 10, year or so, but it actually is an interesting aspect uh, to really consider. And in particular in countries or uh, in places where uh, we have a huge problem of inflation, of actually no cash available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's why tokens are coming into play. What are tokens? And I'm gonna make it super, super simple. Um, we got security tokens. Uh, think about it, cryptocurrency, it's cash. Uh, think about a utility token, that's actually the, your freaking fly miles. Look about, think about an asset token, that's like an ICO, like an IPO. It's basically when you really you know, have a piece of a company. So there are many, many other types of tokens. If you guys wanna know more about that, come up to me. Um, so what we are doing is we are paying Gen Z, we're paying for the data with tokens. So you go uh, and you collect data through your devices. You actually are signing away the ability to, or, or you basically um, have anonymized data, so your data is anonymized. If you want to make money with it, meaning tokens, you basically um, approve that. We use that uh, information and then we contextualize it. So we can never trace it back to you, but you're always gonna get paid for your, for your, for your data. Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're converting the body to new asset class. Those of you, I'm, I also used to be a trader. So it's like basically the body becoming an asset class, being the ab ability to actually gain, um, um, gain revenue from your body. And I think this is a completely new aspect. Again, anonymized, however. That's why blockchain. So those of you who want to learn more about that, let me know about that as well. 
Super Ethos is very, very important for us. So it's really about making sure that we use that data in a way that we understand this uh, disease predictions. We understand why there are certain areas in the world where um, certain, let, let, let's say, pollution levels are actually causing asthma. Certain uh, water pollution causes cancer. So really those cause effects. So really statistical patterns. Very, very important for me. Uh, so again, the other thing is superpowers. Why do I believe in superpowers? I do not believe in health conditions. So if you have um, asthma, if you have another chronic condition, whatever you have, you have a superpower because you know more about that than anybody else in the world. So basically take, using the concept, really taking it the other way around. Like I don't like to say the word sick, it doesn't happen. I even don't like the word health. I like the word body. And I like the word really understanding what I'm doing with the body. So we are using the body as a game controller. You basically are all the time have the ability to really, under, to really make your body into your actual interface. So there are various ways as to, on how you make your body an interface, but one is being a game controller. And the reason for that, why it is so important, is because we are doing super parties. So I'm a hip hop dancer. So the way we are actually going to market and the way we really engage that generation is um, da -da -da, we go into events. Then the way we go to events, I'm a surfer, so we go to surf events. So whoever has been uh, at a surf event, there are a lot of tents, you do activations. You basically really engage. You, for example, we have a product where you have a sensor on a surfboard uh, that actually captures the environment, uh, the environmental aspect of the water, and then you can actually get that, take, that inf take that information and donate it through your tokens. So imagine now you're a member of the Surfrider Foundation, you basically gather the data and you give it to an NGO. You can game with it. So you basically use your body in an environment and you really make sure that we engage by using the body. And so the teenager understands that's the way they actually can engage. The other is a music festival. So whoever has been at Sonar, there's the music, there are lots of other installations. So it's again, really, really engaging and using your body at all times. So it's always the body is the interface. And the way we do it is we use the body, uh, sorry, we use the data and then we contextualize the data. So we're creating data kits. So context is extremely important. Like I said before, if you have now a sports company that actually does need surf data or we creating a, a surf data kit. So that could be for a sports company because they want to learn about, you know, which muscles, which muscles you're using, which products you're buying, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing is also you can use it for NGOs, meaning for the environmental data set that I for, uh, explained before. So again, contextualizing the data, it's what's, what is really important for us. So we did a, uh, a product, uh, sorry, a launch with Fila Sport. So that was basically where, if you were running for 500 miles, you actually got another uh, sneaker shot back to you. So this was really like, how do you incentivize somebody to actually move and get, get going? So again, how do you create those little stories? Um, and that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sabine.